When you hear bakery star bread or artisan loaf, what does that even mean? It's normally a beautiful loaf, tall with a shattering crust, a pillowy open interior with a complex fermented flavor and a lovely chew. The concept of making great artisan bread at home can be intimidating. There are many recipes that require tons of steps, finicky techniques, and expensive gear. So we set out to make it easier for home cooks to make all kinds of artisan quality breads. Boules, dinner rolls, and my favorite, sandwich bread. Today, we're gonna check out a recipe for bakery quality sandwich bread that bakers of any level can easily make at home. No need sandwich bread. I'll teach you everything we learned over years of testing and retesting this recipe. And then we'll see it in action with the Cook's Country Ultimate BLT. And you will see just how worth it this recipe really is. Let's get this bread. Is that what the kids say in this context? We here at ATK didn't invent no need bread. That credit goes to Jim Leahy of the Sullivan Street Bakery in New York. In 2008, Kenji Lopez Alt developed a version of this recipe and we've been testing it and tweaking it ever since. The beauty of no need bread is the very short amount of time you're actively doing anything at all. All the action takes place in this bowl while you're off doing something else altogether. I've got 15 and 1 8 ounce of bread flour in this bowl and I'm gonna whisk in one and a half teaspoons of table salt and a quarter teaspoon of instant yeast. I'm using bread flour because it has a high gluten content, which will give your bread more rise and more chew. I'm gonna stir in seven ounces of water, four ounces of a mild lager, you could use non-alcoholic as well, and a tablespoon of distilled white vinegar. I'm gonna stir this together until a shaggy dough forms. So why are we using beer and vinegar. There are other unusual bread dough ingredients. Well, we're trying to emulate those long fermented artisan breads. This combination emulates the flavor of a long fermented sourdough without the hassle. I just wanna mix the dough until no dry flour remains. We have a rather ugly looking dough that'd be very difficult to make anything with right now. So we're gonna cover it and let it rest. Now we wait. We're gonna let this dough sit at room temperature covered for eight to 18 hours. Now that's a pretty wide time frame. Any time within that range works. The longer you let it sit, the more complex flavors will form and the slightly higher rise you'll get, but ultimately it'll all work. You should just do what works best for you. So why do we need this first rise, also known as the bulk rise, to go on for so long? Well, traditionally, you'd be kneading bread at this point. When you knead dough, you're physically manipulating it. You want the tight balls of protein in the flour to hydrate, unravel, and form gluten. Here, we're harnessing something called an autolyse. Over the long rest period, we allow the flour to hydrate with all the liquid that we've added, which causes the enzymes in the flour to break down its own proteins and form gluten. That's the beautiful thing about this. The gluten development happens all by itself. No expensive stand mixer or tiresome kneading required. The only trade-off is time. We're allowing the water to do all the work. And that's why the hydration level is critical. It's calculated as the total weight of all the liquid ingredients divided by the weight of the flour. In this recipe, there are 11 and a half ounces of liquids divided by 15 and 1 8 ounces of flour. That gives a 76% hydration level. This will be a very wet dough. It'll be very sticky and it would be a pain to knead, but luckily we don't need to handle it. During testing, we compared those made with a 71% hydration level, 76% hydration level, and 81% hydration level. The 71% loaf was too dry and ended up denser and flatter than the 76% one, which was lighter and airier. But there's a limit to how much hydration a dough can take. The 81% dough wasn't quite as risen as the 76% dough because the extra hydration weighed it down. So it started to collapse just at the lip of the loaf pan. More hydration doesn't always mean better bread. After the bulk rise, it should look like this. Quite the transformation. You can really see that the water's done its work. It's gone from a tight, dry ball to something loose and relaxed. And at the same time, the yeast has done its work too and risen, and so it's really puffed up. But it's very sticky now. So to give it a nice dome top, I'm gonna to fold the dough over itself eight times. Now, it's very sticky, so I'm gonna need some water to prevent my hands from sticking to the dough. Now, before you say anything, this is folding, it's not kneading. Kneading is a much more aggressive action. Here, we're simply just realigning the dough so that we have a nice dome top. Three, four, five. And then if your hands do start to stick, just dunk them in the water, and it's much easier to fold the dough without it sticking. I'll flip it. 
and let it relax for another 15 minutes covered. I'm gonna flour the board because the dough is very, very sticky. And we're gonna take the dough out and we're gonna flip it seam side up onto our counter. And we're gonna pat this into an eight by six inch rectangle. I'm gonna roll it away from myself to form a tight cylinder. What we're doing again is we're increasing the surface tension on the outside of the loaf so it'll inflate really nicely. And at the same time, we're also creating a slight spiral pattern on the inside so it'll look very attractive as well. So now we want the seam on the underside. I'm just gonna pinch it closed and I'll pinch the sides as well so that it stays nice and tight and compact. I'm gonna transfer this to a greased loaf pan. I'll recover it and we're gonna proof it. So this is a second rise where the loaf has already been shaped and it just needs to expand a little bit. The yeast is gonna continue to do its work. This will take another hour to an hour and a half. We're looking for the dough to rise about an inch above the lip of the loaf pan. About halfway through the proof, preheat a large Dutch oven in a 475 degree oven for 30 minutes. When the proof is done, it's time to bake. I'll make a little slash about three inches long on the top. I'll put the loaf pan into the Dutch oven and recover, then bake it for 30 minutes. It's this enclosed environment that's part of the genius of this technique. As the moisture of the dough evaporates, it creates steam. And steam is a much more efficient conductor of heat than air. So the dough gets a blast of heat that causes the bread to rise more quickly and much higher. And this is known as oven spring. When we tested the same dough in an unheated Dutch oven, the rise was much dinkier and the crumb was less open. After 30 minutes, uncover the pots and let it cook until golden brown. This takes another 10 to 15 minutes. We'll let the loaf rest in the pan for another 15 minutes so the outside can firm up. Then we'll let it cool for three hours before we can eat it. As good as hot bread sounds, it does need to cool, otherwise it'll be a gummy mess inside. Just look at this beautiful loaf. Lofty, with this gorgeous shiny top. Remember, it got the shiny top from the enclosed, steamy environment. The water condensed on it, evaporates, and creates this lovely crisp crust. You can even hear it. Oh, you know that's gonna be good. We were so happy with these results that my colleague Camilla Chaparro used the same recipe to make a rustic boule, dinner rolls, and more. The roll was exactly the same, we just shape the loaves differently and tweak some of the cook times. One recipe, many opportunities. And it really only took us two, maybe three minutes of active time to make this bread. Right, enough talking, let's make some BLTs. To cook the bacon, spread it out on an aluminum foil lined rim baking sheet. Bake in a 400 degree oven until it's deeply browned and crispy. While the bacon cooks, whisk together two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, one tablespoon of red wine vinegar, a quarter teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. Slice three vine ripened tomatoes into quarter inch slices and marinate in the dressing. You don't necessarily need peak high quality tomatoes to make this ultimate BLT. Any tomatoes will taste a load better with this treatment. Whisk a half cup of mayo, a quarter cup of chopped basil, one and a half teaspoons of lemon juice and a pinch of cayenne together. We're going to broil our bread, but just on one side. That way you get two different textures, crisp on one side and soft and plush on the other. But keep an eye on it, it'll only take one to two minutes. So for our BLTs, we're gonna grab two slices of bread. I like these ones, just the right amount of char. We're gonna put them the toasted side down and then we're gonna use our lemon basil mayo as basically our, our butter. We really wanna lubricate things nicely. We're gonna lay on some bacon. I'm gonna choose the extra crispy bits here. The thing you really don't want when you add tomatoes to a sandwich is for them to sog it out. So we're gonna protect it with a protective layer of lettuce. Then we can put down our tomatoes and they're not gonna sog out the sandwich. We'll lay a couple of slices on top and then we're gonna put this other slice of lettuce on top of that. So both sides of the bread are protected. A few more slices of bacon and crown it with the top. Oh, wow, look at that. Need a cocktail stick? <laughs> that looks so good. Oh yeah, let's taste it. <laughs> that is so good. The first thing you get is that crunch on the outside. You get that little bit of char, and then that gives away this lovely fresh bread flavor, which has been wakened up in the oven. And then you get all the things in the inside. You get that juicy tomato right in the middle. And it's really kind of just been seasoned with the bacon, as little crumbly bits, and that lovely little bit of mayo. Such a good sandwich. Mmm. 
So this is definitely an upgraded BLT, but how does it compare to the same sandwich made with regular supermarket bread? Let's find out. Sandwich, please. Thank you so much. This is the same sandwich, same interior at least, and it looks pretty similar. Let's taste it. That is definitely a great sandwich, but you've lost something, just a little bit. So with this one, the bread tastes sweet. It's a little bit crunchy. It's not very chewy. The bread it kind of dissolves a little bit once it's in your mouth. The inside is, of course, exactly the same, but you've really just lost that extra dimension. And that's from the long fermentation time. Like supermarket breads really ferment for like one to two hours, maybe. Whereas this one fermented for almost 18, 19 hours, and you can really taste it. You can taste it A, in the flavor, but also in the texture as well. This one's very pappy. It kind of dissolves in your mouth. Whereas this one, you really get that long pillowy chew, really satisfying to eat with an extra bit of flavor too. You can really see the difference in the crumb. So the left one here is a supermarket bread, and this one is very fine, even foam, versus the one we made ourselves. It's got a much more open structure, and that's because of the gluten there. And that gluten tells you it's gonna be chewier, it's gonna be more satisfying to eat. It's just an upgraded experience. This is great, this is better. What sandwich would you make with this bread? Let me know in the comments below. Hit the like button, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video.